On this week's episode, we're going to discuss Facebook loves open source and more than Microsoft hearts open source. That's impossible. It's hard to accept, Michael, but it's true. It's true. Welcome to Destination Linux, your favorite video podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm Michael. And I'm Wendy. What are you doing here, Wendy? You're supposed to be on that other show. That was oh, Linux I'm sorry. I'll loud. go ahead and leave. I didn't mean to intrude. No, no, oh, stay, stay, okay, stay. Okay, we got okay, a robotics topic. We need you. <laughs> cool. Jill couldn't make it this week, so we got Wendy to sub in. And we've got an awesome show because we're also going to be covering how the Terminator might just be open source after all. Mm-hmm. Plus, we got some Linux gaming and our software spotlight and so much more. So let's get the show on the road toward Destination Linux. Our feedback this week comes from Cater, and he is responding to something we talked about with Snaps. So he says, the major problems with Snaps are not only the proprietary server and the flawed technical design and other things, but also, as as far as I understand, SnapD still relies on out-of-tree app armor patches that are only applied in Ubuntu's kernels. This alone, and the fact that some Linux distributions like Red Hat, Fedora, and others don't use (laughs) AppArmy. Don't use App Armor, not App Army. I mean, you know, one and the same, right? Right. At all makes Snaps no alternative to Flatpak, but a simple means for Canonical to forcefully increase their market share. And then they finish by saying Flatpak, on the other hand, can be installed in every distribution without any drawbacks. This is something the Linux press should have been reported porting massively, in my honest opinion. Are we the Linux press? Are we Linux Press? I think that we technically count. No. Uh, I actually think that we are the... They're big media. I'm not big media. The Linux Press is big media. This week in Linux, I would call Linux Press, maybe. Yeah, but not this show. No. Oh, it's not... This is not really necessarily a new show. I I, guess it's true. I didn't know if they were if they were blaming us, like we should have been covering this. You know, like if that was accusatory or if it was more like... The Linux press, like a, a who blanket is the statement press? that all yeah. of the Linux media should be covered. Well, we're covering it now, yeah. so I feel like we did a good. We're doing good for humanity here, um, good Michael. Safe. There's a lot of controversy here uh, in this one or two paragraphs of information, and I would love to say that Cater is wrong in a lot of this, but I don't think they are. I think a so, lot of this is true. There's a lot of uh, interesting aspects to this. And I would say that the part that I kind of skipped over, but they said that uh, one of the problems with the technical design is the loop devices. I don't necessarily think that that is a, a big problem. Sure, it's annoying to see it in your, uh, when you're, you're doing output of your drives and that sort of stuff. It might pop up those in, as loop devices, but you can also hide those away so it's not that big of a deal if, if you are working with the command line and stuff like that. Um, but I will say that there are things that are problematic because it's interesting that they're talking about the out of tree aspects of App Armor because Canonical makes App Armor. Now they weren't the founders of the project, but they did take it over many, many years ago. And it's interesting because why does Ubuntu have a different App Armor than regular App Armor? That's a that's an interesting thought that would be a lot more uh, details. We'd need somebody from Canonical to answer that sort of thing. But it is interesting that there that does exist, and if that's if there's an like, for example, uh, Susa uses App Armor, and they have a different version than Ubuntu, and that's one of the reasons why it doesn't work exactly the same on on Open Susa, and it, and that's a fair that's a fair point because that is kind of weird. Yeah, I figured you'd already asked Spaceman what his response to this would be. I'm really shocked since you two are BFFs, Michael. Uh, well, honestly, me and me and Space Bro uh, hadn't had a chance to talk about it, uh, unfortunately, because uh, yeah, he's space. You call him Spaceman. I call him Space Bro because we're homies. And uh, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to talk to him about it. But that's also because when I did talk to him about it, I or talked to him in the interviews, I forgot completely about this particular topic. <laughs> yeah. So Well, it's that. an interesting one because I started doing some research and I came across the github.com for Nextcloud Snap. And in there is a wiki article that was written by Kyle Fazari in February 10th, 2023. And... He says something really interesting in here when we're talking about the security issue, because what I really honed in on is, wait a minute, I can use snaps in other distros, but 
what we're claiming here is that it won't be secure anymore if I use them in other distros because they're written to be sandboxed through AppArmor, right? And so the title of this article is why Ubuntu is the only supported distro for Nextcloud Snap. And when one paragraph states, most non-Ubuntu distributions don't have all the underlying security tech that Snaps require, most of the time what's missing is AppArmor. So very similar to the comment here. For those distros, SnapD transparently, without warning, runs in a degraded security state where confinement is completely broken and Snaps can access the host system. In Snaps, services run as root. Traditionally, such things are terrifying, but it's okay in Ubuntu because Snaps are confined, which means even though the service is running as the root user, it's confined root without any real special privileges. However, on non-Ubuntu distributions that lack proper confinement, Snaps that have services are running as real root with no confinement. Hmm. That is very interesting. And it, in some distributions that that probably would be correct in some things, they also have like, for example, Fedora has a kind of a sidestep to that where they have an SC Linux structure set up where it is confining snaps, but it's not confining snaps in an individual case. It's confining snaps to the concept of snaps. So as an, uh, individual isolation that's not happening, but all snaps are confined in a like a global container. And that is interesting in the sense because the root doesn't have access to the host system like is said here, but in other distributions that would possibly be correct that that would happen. And in the case of Fedora, it, while it doesn't happen to the root system, like the actual host system, it could get to other snaps. So if you want to attack another snap, you could still do that. And that mm. is in itself also kind of a problem. Very interesting. I don't know. Um, I always have said I have a preference for flat packs. Uh, and I will use Snaps, though, when it's obviously convenient and it's through the software store Same. and things. But it seems like the deeper we go down this Snap uh, rabbit hole, the worse Snaps kind of look. Like, to me, this is not a good look for something that's saying, hey, we're making this package system universally available but we're not really packaging the security along with it universally because we're requiring you to utilize mostly app armors version and not just any app armor. We have a special app armor that we do additional patches to that the rest of you don't get either. And that 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 just seems weird. weird. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree that that's that it's very weird that there is a difference between Ubuntu's app armor and app armor when canonical runs both of them. Why is there a difference? I don't, I don't know. I that's, could see that's there being user. a different version that Canonical uses that's really defined to their distribution to make it work better, to make it mix, work smoother with their distro, maybe. But if they are going to make it truly universal across all of the different distros, then this app armor thing has got to get figured out. It, it's got to be either easy to install for the user so they can say, hey, I want to use Snaps and I'm going to bring App Armor along with it so that I have that confinement if that's what you're looking for. Or just decide that, hey, I'm I'm on this distribution, so it's not really a universal package for me and I'm going to go the flat pack route. I think uh, I, what I want to do, Michael, if we can, is take this email and send it to someone, one of our contacts at Ubuntu, and see if they'll respond. It would be interesting. And mm-hmm. we can come back in another show. Definitely. And but, you know, um, Cater says in here something interesting, uh, but a simple means for Canonical to forcefully increase their market share. And I'm kind of conflicted on that statement because there's no Definitely. money in Snaps. Uh, there's no market share for them to really own anything i mean specific, they also have dominance on the desktop for sure yeah they kind of like, already maybe that's that what he means that. not necessarily market share itself but as far right. as like the percentage amount of linux is ubuntu instead of another distro maybe that's well i mean he there's also an argument of like is that valuable to canonical because i mean they're not the biggest company in the market they have right the largest users user space uh for the amount of people who are on the, on the desktop and also on the servers. Like there are a lot of people who are using Ubuntu on like uh, DigitalOcean and stuff like that. But at the same time, they're not making any money from that because it's not a part of the enterprise uh, approach and that sort of thing. So but is arguably, that value? Arguably, you could say that, let's say Canonical gets Adobe to release a snap of their product or Office because they do have 
probably some of the strongest partnerships out there with mm-hmm. a lot of corporations. Mm-hmm. Not the strongest, but some of the strongest of the of the Linux distros out there. And if they were able to make that happen, right, then mm-hmm. Ubuntu is the only one with actual Microsoft Office on it, which a lot of people need, or Adobe or some other product like that, and it only works through Snaps. Then they kind of increase their market share by creating a little bit of a walled guard. I'm not saying they're doing that, but I could see that being not, I wouldn't put it past a company either. Uh, I could see that being part of a strategy too, potentially. It's an interesting point. I mean, obviously the Adobe thing is not going to happen because their stuff is terrible and in the cloud-based system and all that sort of stuff. So, and it's gotten worse, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. The Microsoft thing and the Office thing, that would be very interesting. If if they were able to get Office onto Linux and it was through a snap, that would be a, fa- a, valid, a valid point that people would have for that. I, I, do, I do think that it's it's not necessarily forcefully increasing their market share. They're not forcing people to use Snap. And I know people say this all the time, like, well, I try to install this Deb and it gives me a Snap. Well, the Deb doesn't exist. So it's either you get nothing or you get a Snap. So which one is better, nothing or a Snap? You well, could, the Deb did you exist, could, but Canonical specifically had well, resources they maintained making it themselves. It. Right, and so they, had they to decided, it. I'm not going to maintain this anymore. Therefore, the deb doesn't exist. That's yeah, what you and mean. I also think it's kind of funny that people would like complain that my, uh, uh, Canonical is not maintaining something anymore. It's like, well, okay, so you're saying that they have to both make a snap and a deb. Which, by the way, for those who don't know, managing a deb is annoying. Let, let's let's just put it out there. And it's all you could argue that RPMs are almost as bad, but debs are definitely the worst here because. When you have a deb, you don't have one single deb that works on all versions of a distro. It might only work exclusively on one distribution, and it also might ex- might work on exclusively a version, and you have to make multiple versions of the same package on the same distro based on the version of the distro. Like, for example, a 2404 and a 2410 and a, 23, a 2310, and all of those would be different packages that you have to maintain separately. And you have to maintain continuously as long as you agree to keep that system running. So if you have like the, the LTS thing that Ubuntu does, you have a commitment of many, many packages to maintain in addition to other things that you're doing. So when people get mad at that, it's like, if you want to say that it's not a good look or good optics for them to give you a snap by default and just say, oh, it'd be better if it was nothing, just give you an error. I, you could argue that that's not better, but I mean, if, if in terms of like optics, you could say that that's better. But to say that they are required to maintain the deb, I think that's kind of nonsense. But I don't feel like this is forcing people because it's not like when you do apt install whatever and it says you it shows you the snap, it doesn't force you to install the snap. You, it asks yeah. you, do you want the snap? And if you choose to take it, then that's one thing. And it does, it's not like it pretends There's some semantics snap, there, I think. But right, I, 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 it's, it, it's more frustration, yeah. right? It's more frustration that I want to install the deb and the only thing that I can find is a snap and I don't like snaps. It's, it's kind of the, the feeling that I get. The frustration that I want a deb package, but now all I can find is a snap when I used to be able to get a deb. Yeah. I mean, that's fair, but it's also the same kind of thing of like just complaining that they're not making a deb. You know, that's the right. same, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, And if you well, want to say that that's I think there's bigger annoying, sure, but it's here. like, it's not required. The, mm-hmm. This is a bigger issue, I would say, than any of that. And Cater, yeah, yeah. thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, we will see if Ubuntu will respond. Maybe they have a good reason for some of this, or maybe we'll find out that, you know, in SE Linux, that there's more sandboxing available than we thought. And so we'll mm-hmm. get some more research and you know, bring it back to the show and, here. But this is why I love our community. You send in interesting mm-hmm. things. We have one take. You have a different. You can change our mind. We should have one of those boards. Change our mind on snaps. You know, there you go. Uh, if you want to ask the community, if you want to ask us a question from the community or you want to send in a comment like this, disagree with something we said on the show, like last week, Michael was so harsh on 1080p. Uh, do that, that by destinationlinux.net slash comments and let us know your thoughts and feedback and you get us talking like this here this we didn't plan to have this be a big part of our show but look at what you did cater look at what you did <laughs> look at what you did this what is did, your fault this is what you did to the show <laughs> that's really interesting it's really interesting information and i agree it's kind of underreported honestly because oh, i yeah. hadn't heard about this so 
you know, there you yeah, go. I didn't know how far it went. I knew about the SE Linux in Fedora, but I didn't know how far it went. So, and I think that, and I've always been a flat pack first type of person. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm just talking about like the different nuances of Snap because there's so many people who want to attack all the time. And I don't mean just canonical. They want to attack everyone. Like yeah. Red Hat used to not get attacked. And then all of a sudden that has changed. And now they're attacked all the time, no matter how good stuff they make or what, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And the same thing with like every other company that's involved in Linux. And I just want to make it point out that I'm not necessarily saying that there's not issues with snaps and there's not issues with flat packs. I mean, they're not perfect. Nothing is. So well, it's just the difference yourself. of like, if you, if you <laughs> okay, fair enough. Apparently Ryan's perfect. <laughs> so I mean, let's just, talk my to point his is, wife. <laughs> oh, nope. That's not the door. Let's not bring up that subject, huh? So I, I think it's important to point out the issues that are there. And it's definitely important to make sure that we, you know, don't put any push anything under the rug. But it also is important to do it in a a cordial way, you know? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got a lot of non cordial people in our comment section. La, like, a lot. like a lot. Like a lot. That's true. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Collide. In a perfect world, end users would only work on managed devices with IT-approved apps. But the BYOD, or the bring-your-own-device trend, is here, and it's here to stay. It's been in full swing for quite a while. Employees use their personal devices and unapproved apps that aren't protected by MDM or IAM or any other security tool. And there's a giant gap between the security tools that we have and the way that we actually work. One password calls it the access trust gap. And now Collide has joined forces with one password. So Collide brings their user first device trust solution, which notifies users as it detects something uh, on their device. And it teaches them how to solve it without needing help from IT. And one password brings their extended access management to secure every sign in for every app on every device. Now, this is a fantastic combination because Collide is designed for companies with Okta. So if you're using Okta and you're looking for a device trust solution, then look no further than Collide. Plus, now that they've joined up with 1Password and their extended access management, it's just going to get better. Now, Collide plus 1Password, they care about your user experience and the privacy too, which means it can go places other tools can't like personal and contractor devices. It ensures that every device is known and healthy and every login is protected. So stop trying to ban BYOD or shadow IT and start protecting them with Collide and 1Password Extended Access Management. Support the show and go to destinationlinux.net slash K-O-L-I-D-E. That's destinationlinux.net slash Collide. Go there and get more details on these great security solutions. That's destinationlinux.net slash Collide. All right. Let's move on, Michael, to a very interesting topic, Facebook. When you said interesting, I, I think we have different definitions of that word. I love Facebook. Like, it's my fa I just love going on there and posting little pictures about myself. And Hey, Ryan, um, do you have a Facebook account? No, I've never, I don't have a Facebook account at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I pretend, you see. see the level really of crap in the room was, like, climbing, and so Michael's just <laughs> trying to, like... Push it like, down. I just, just got to bring back, bring yeah. it back to reality. <laughs> yeah. There's no Facebook in my life. No, but it is interesting about this company and a lot of the things that they do that puts me in this weird position. And I need you to help me figure it out, Michael. So we're talking about Facebook or more like meta specifically. And it's interesting because they have contributed a lot to open source and We've talked about it on, on, in the past, uh, various different projects that they have launched and, you know, things like Llama, which is the machine learning stuff that's open source. And they also have done a lot, a lot of work on ButterFS and many, many more projects. So the real question is, do we care enough about the work they've done in open source to ignore all the stuff that they have done in terms of privacy issues? And if not, what could Meta do to kind of like maybe make us more open-minded to them. Cause it, so that's let's my be fair, conflict. it's been a long time. That's my conflict. I'm, I'm a privacy enthusiast and I also am an open source enthusiast. The open source enthusiast in me says, Hey man, 
Facebook has done some incredible things for open source. Llama, OOMD, PSI, ButterFS, Magma for telecom enterprise level Linux. Yep. The founding of the Open Compute Project, which uses open source uh, to enable the creation of efficient, flexible, and scalable hardware for data centers. So this is getting Linux all over the cloud. Development of PyTorch. How many times with this AI stuff have you heard of PyTorch being used? And that's Facebook, major sponsor of I Linux I didn't know Foundation. that about PyTorch at all. Yeah. One of the top contributors to the Linux kernel by change sets and line changed. Lines changed in 2023 and many, many years, you know, before that as well. Like they're one of the top contributors. So again, open source me says, man, Facebook's pretty awesome. Maybe Mark Zuckerberg isn't the boring Android. But then the <laughs> privacy enthusiast in me says, I hate that Android. Like he's no data on Star Trek. You know, he's a bad Android. What was the bad version of data? He had like a lore. Lore. He's the lore of data, you know, the privacy so person. In we me. have to like put that in terms of um, Army of Darkness for me. Good Ash, Bad Ash. There you go. Good Ash. Because <laughs> you're not a Star Trek. I'm not person, a Star Trek which person. Is, right. Which is your biggest downfall. <laughs> it is. That is like, one. Of, that is pretty much the only flaw, really. Yeah. yeah. The biggest. I'll, I'll the take biggest. it. Yeah. Did, oh, have you seen Star Wars, though? <laughs> no, I don't like Star Wars either. Okay. Well, now, that's okay. I don't know. I mean, I mean, Star Wars got, kind of, I mean it's, it's one thing to not see Star Trek because there's no. so much of it, but I guess there's also a ton of it in the son of Star Wars now, too. Yeah. Anyway. Thanks, Disney. It was pumping yeah. out crap. <laughs> Thanks, Disney. All right. <laughs> so, Especially the new stuff. Come on. Uh, I also want to add in an interesting thing that I noticed that kind of spawned this idea in my head is that there was an article about how Mark Zuckerberg this week is becoming popular again because of his work in open source. And now Elon Musk is the most hated billionaire. Uh, at the moment, which is kind of funny because, uh, you know, Zuckerberg was kind of the go to like, if you're going to make fun of a billionaire, talk about Mark Zuckerberg. And for a while there, uh, Elon was the golden child. And now everybody hates him because of X and Twitter. Not everyone, but, you know, people who think that billionaires care what they think. And then uh, <laughs> so my question really is like, you've got what are you saying that Elon doesn't care what I think? Yeah, that would be no. Amazing. yeah, no. People are like, I don't like you. Oh, no. Let me go smoke another million dollar bill. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, Meta has Facebook. It has WhatsApp and Instagram, amongst many right. other things. Mm -hmm. WhatsApp is an interesting one for me because it is, if you talk to anybody outside the United States, it's pretty much the universal messaging app that everybody uses. Oh, yeah. And, and it's supposed to have some encryption in it. Right, supposed to have some encryption uh, based on it and some privacy in there, but uh, I also understand they recently integrated AI uh, features into WhatsApp and things, which scares the crap out of me from that privacy standpoint, amongst many others. Um, so when I think about what could Facebook do to win me over, one of the first things I want to say is let's talk about WhatsApp. Let's start there because it's going to be a long jump for me to get to any of these other apps, but let's start with WhatsApp. Um, since a lot of people use it internationally, I would want a true, real, state-of-the-art, end-to-end encryption that's open source that we could act like Signal uses, that we could right. actually have transparency. I mean, technically, WhatsApp says that they use Signal's protocol for the They use a, a edited version of Signal's right. protocol. What I, I would prefer they just open source WhatsApp and show that. It, I mean, at this point, you have so much competition. It's not like you have any secret sauce. Your secret sauce is your brand and your market penetration. If you open source now, none of that will change. The only thing you might get some uh, some like clones and that might happen with forks and whatever, but you won't lose any of the market share because the people who are already using your application don't seem to care that it's owned by Facebook or don't know. So it won't really change anything. Also, by the way, WhatsApp is a fantastic name. Like, what's up? But it's an app, so what's it's good. I like it. Right. Okay. So I've never used this application. Do you have to pay to use it? No. No. Are there ads? You do have to it? give your you, no. No. But the way they the, the it is the same. It was so Signal has changed recently, but it was the same structure of you have to sign up with your phone number and that sort of thing. So in a way, they are they are collecting your data by having your phone number and associating you. So they you can't hide your phone number from them. Even in the encryption aspects, because I mean, Signal still knows who you are when you sign up as your number, right. but um, to a degree anyway. But it's the, other, the everything else is supposed to be encrypted. 
whether or not it is, I mean, it's it's Facebook. Well, so. Metadata, the metadata WhatsApp collects is who you're chatting with, when the conversation started and ended, and the number of messages exchanged. Theoretically, they can't see what you're talking to that person about based on their encryption. But there are obviously lots of concerns with the fact that uh, they could have back doors into WhatsApp to allow law enforcement and others to. Yeah. And also like, that's just what they're saying that they look at. They don't, and there's no way to prove that's what they're doing. Because it's not open source. Yeah. Right. Right. So if they were to do that, that would be a strong, very strong indicator that they are changing or have changed. Right. Because why do they need that data on the back end of who I'm talking to? Yeah. Why does that matter unless they're using it for potentially other They're totally purposes? using it. I mean, they're, t- they're using right. it, for sure. Yeah. This is more of like, if they're if that's all they're doing, prove it. You know, if you're yeah. not actually looking at the t- messages and that sort of stuff, prove it by open sourcing it. And that would be, that would go a long way, in my opinion. Especially considering if you take a look at all the other stuff that they have open source, it's stuff that they don't make money on. Like, Right. Well, and was, they're not making money on WhatsApp. Before. That was kind of like why I was asking if they were serving you ads or anything like that. They're, well, they're already they're building not a profile making money on it. on it. Yeah, I think they are in a way. So so here's how it would work. So uh, Michael has a Facebook account, let's say, and I don't. But we're using WhatsApp to communicate. And it realizes that me and Michael communicate all the time. We're always talking about something. So it automatically, since it has a profile on Facebook of Michael, and it knows, hey, Michael likes Rocket League. Michael likes Doritos. Uh, so Ryan, who talks to Michael all the time, probably likes those things too. So let's serve them some ads based on that. And so while they don't, while I don't have a Facebook, they're still building a profile on me. They know who my contacts are, the people I contact. And some of those people have their information out there on the internet that they could say, well, if you know, that person does it, then this person's probably one plus one probably equals two. So let's serve him ads. And people don't, people can change their phone number, but it doesn't happen often. So they could associate that stuff and even find the name of the person. Like there's been reports of people signing up for Facebook with their phone number or whatever, or their email address or something. And then Facebook knows their name and their friends and suggests people who are actually their friends to to, like, how would you know that? That's super weird. Right. So yeah. like there, there are reports of that sort of thing. And it even has a name, shadow profiles. Yeah. There you go. That's not yeah. creepy uh, at all. And it probably goes way deeper in that because you're talking about a company that's past failures include Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and for those not familiar with that, um, that's a whole mess that messed up a whole lot of things. Yeah. And you can, um, you can, can do some research on it. It's a fascinating story. There's documentaries on it. But Facebook... Uh, basically, their failures to control third-party APIs was one of the big reasons uh, that Cambridge Analytica happened. And so, you know, Facebook, again, um, would I want them to go away tomorrow? No. And that's really hard for me to say out of swallow before I said it, because <laughs> you've got thousands and thousands of very well paid, some of the best hackers. I mean, that's what Mark Zuckerberg is known for is going specifically for hackers, code hackers out there. And a lot of them are working on open source stuff in a major way and making incredible things for us. What I would like to see is Facebook become a company that we actually could say, hey, and they're still a company. They're still going to do stupid things, but they're all right. They're all right. You know, like I don't hate them. So Facebook brand is already destroyed. That's, That's why, they, why switched to Meta. they switched to Meta. Yes. So what I'm saying is that let us like Meta. You know, if you're going to change the brand anyway, because you've already destroyed the name, why not keep the Facebook thing, you know, in the sense of like, you're not going to be able to fix that reputation. Even if you do fix the pro- policies and stuff, it's pretty much shot there. But if you're going to be, you know, rebrand and everything, why not also refocus to be an open source company? Now, I know that that is a, a very grandiose idea and a very unlikely, but if you were to do that, you would get so much value from it because you're already doing so many great open source things. Why not just fully embrace it rather than like right. half embrace? Well, I don't know that it's grandiose. And here's why. Like they're known for the work they've been doing with Llama 3. You look at NVIDIA here. NVIDIA is now a $3 trillion company practically overnight. Makes no sense because 
like oh man this whole ai thing is so overblown by the way uh it's like always having the dumbest person in the room and somehow people think it's the most important thing but it's always hallucinating constantly has the wrong answers but this is going to change our world all right i love how it how, how it's the the phrase of this is hallucinating rather than making up nonsense <laughs> yeah exactly they come up with like a clever word oh no it's just hallucinating it's fine you know yeah I can't just sit, imagine sitting in a room and just randomly spouting out nonsense that has nothing to do with what you're talking about. And people are like, pay him more. He's more important. Let's replace other employees with that guy right there. Because that's what we're doing with AI right now. Because I think AI will be a major player. But right now, it's kind of dumb in a lot of ways, like really dumb. So anyways, NVIDIA is a $3 trillion company overnight. All right. Because everybody loves to say the AI thing. And Facebook has been in the news heavily for the work they've been doing with Llama and open sourcing it. Plus, they have their own versions of, of non-open source stuff there as well. But, you know, I think this is a play for Facebook to potentially take on the likes, which is their goal of somebody like NVIDIA in this arena by going into and, and really honing down on the open source AI modeling and the hardware and things that could come along with that and the software stuff too that they could implement because it's going to be far cheaper for companies to get involved with. Chat GPT is huge. Did you guys see this week that Apple signed with Chat GPT? They didn't make their no. own. They yeah. did not make their own AI. They went with Chat GPT integration in their phones, which blew me away that they would do that. And it's it's interesting. Wow. Like the Apple intelligence thing is very interesting and there's so much to un unpack from that. But it could be a whole episode. I don't know so. if we have time for that. But yeah. it is interesting that they did that. But they also said that most of it is going to be on the device itself. So the vast majority of things you do through Siri slash the new AI thing is going to not go through Chat GPT. It's going to go through uh, their own local thing. And if it does need to go out to servers, it will go to uh, Apple's servers and Apple's AI stuff. And then if it absolutely can't go to any of that and it has to go to ChatGPT, it will ask you for permission to do that beforehand. So they they spent a lot of time talking about, oh, actually, what's funny is that in the announcement, the they like, okay, they they took a very little time talking about, hey, we're we're associated with ChatGPT. Then they took a lot of time trying to make that seem okay with all the privacy aspects and stuff. They didn't leave it to like, yeah. you know, mystery or anything and people like well, coming it, up with what could happen. Apple, a $2 trillion company, doesn't invent their own AI? Oh yeah, of course they could afford to do that themselves. Why in the world yeah. Apple, of all people who hates using anybody else's stuff, decides like, we're just going to use chat GPT. I don't in think that future, happened. In the future, they may go with their own. Because they started out with somebody else's chips, right? So in the Intel, future, they right. could potentially go on their own. And we know how bad Siri is. So the first thing you ask it, it's going to ask if it can go out to the other servers. Exactly. <laughs> Supposedly, I mean, they're really. going to fix it. Uh, that's, that's probably <laughs> true. But I think it, you make an interesting point, Wendy, because you know when you, when you look at it, Apple was not able to see that this chat GPT thing was going to be as, as big and powerful as uh, obviously it has become. And they did not feel like they could put something on the market that would surpass what Microsoft is. So they went in with the same company. They went with the same company Microsoft gave $10 billion to or more now at this point um, and are utilizing the same technology there with their little twist on it. Cause they're, they're going to have a local version on it. Now look at Facebook out there. Now, Facebook has AI technology and nobody's signing up. None of these big companies are signing up for it. So they have to do some type of play here. They're going to have to enhance this fast. And they're going to have to have a lot of, um, they have a lot of work to really make this thing as powerful as chat GPT is going to keep quadrupling every release probably in its power and things. So okay, again, so I think there's a play coming back to where Facebook going open source with their AI right. and things and continuing to push that makes sense. I th I totally agree. It does make sense. But also, I want to go back a little bit because we were talking about how AI is hallucinating. And that's basically creating speculation. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to hallucinate on the show? So, for example, let's say that the reason why they are, in theory, connecting to ChatGPT is they're going to do the classic Apple where they get access to something like they did with Xerox, take it all, and then remake a better thing 
mm-hmm. and then ha ha, we got you. And uh, who knows? That could be it. Exactly. Who says that all of the data that's coming in as they're using Chat GPT's back end, they're not saving to create their own? Yeah. yeah. Oh, also, another hallucination possibility is what if Chat GPT is paying Apple to use Chat GPT as a licensing thing so that they can get on the devices for all the Apple people? Mm. Who knows? It's There's possible. so many possibilities. It's possible. Yes, yeah. it's absolutely possible. And if Meta does go open source, they could still deliver ads. I'm not against ads. Ads are used inside this network just to fund the network and keep it going. Like, it makes sense. But it's nice to be able to have an option, especially on some of the other websites that I go to, where I can click the button that says, hey, don't serve me personal ads. You can serve me right. ads. Just don't track yeah. my data and serve me personalized ads. It's the DuckDuckGo right? model, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. DuckDuckGo will still give you an ad if you type for bread, and they're going to show you an ad for bread, but it's right. not going to track you afterwards. It's just you type bread, here's a bread ad. Makes right. sense. This is a fair exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. I think for me, it's about data minimization. Even letting me pay to leave my data out of their marketing sales efforts would be a big help. I think obviously the open source um, and transparency is going to be a big thing for them because nobody's going to trust their claims after Cambridge Analytica and everything else. Plus, we've been lied to so much in there. But anyways, I wanted to bring this into this discussion with you all because I just think it's interesting. Facebook has done, and they deserve praise for this, a lot of great things for open source and have some of the most brilliant engineers working for them. And I appreciate all of that work. In a lot of cases, I'd say they've done more for open source than Microsoft has. But uh, they got a long way to go in a privacy front to really gain trust there. And to answer your question I do it. about how could I trust them again, if I didn't need a container for Facebook because of what <laughs> they do and the tracking, then I could yep. trust them again. But mm. until I don't need that container anymore, I don't trust them. There you go. That's true. I mean, even if they did open we'll source say. WhatsApp, the fact that you right. have to block them from tracking you everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that, yep. that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah. It can do uh, better. Yeah, All right. But, so but Mark, also, the hit us also, up. You said something about how they do better than Microsoft and open source. I'm like, that is, it's a very low bar. <laughs> <laughs> now, Microsoft does a lot of kernel contributions and things like that. And they, that's they, true, but they it's also a low, still add, a low bar. They yeah. add Linux to Microsoft. I mean, there you go. Yeah. Right? yeah. They've got they WSL, Linux. man. What else do you want, dude? <laughs> uh, Windows best. applications in Linux or more specifically oh. Office. Well, no, we'll Linux. put them right, on right. Mac, their biggest competitor, but we yeah. won't put them on Linux. Yeah. The one they love in heart. We won't yep. put them there. It makes sense. That would make too much sense there. Uh, All right. So, Wendy, uh, Facebook may be not the most exciting topic, but I think it's interesting for a community to think about. But I know one that right. is exciting, and that's robotics. And I know you specifically uh, know a lot about this world because you do a lot, a lot of competitions of and yeah. things in robotics. It's absolutely amazing. So it turns out that the future creation of Skynet and the Terminators, one of my favorite movies, and that movie stands the test of time. You could still go back and watch it today and it's just as good. Like, I'm fully in okay. there. Okay, so one and darn. two are just as good. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, any, there was no, any of the Terminators past one and two. I mean, there there was. No, uh, nope, um, was not. They it's don't like exist Wars. in the world of Ryan, so. Exactly. They're not in your head, headcanon? <laughs> no, they're not in my headcanon. <laughs> uh, it turns out Skynet and Terminators are open source after all, because... Well, this is the nice Terminator, not the killer one. You know, the Arnold one is like, come with me if you want to oh, live. Oh, the Terminator 2 version. Yeah, that version I of Terminator. See. Because okay. your favorite company, Michael Hugging Face. I mean, I like that name a lot. It's such hilarious. a good name. And then Pollen Robotics have teamed up and released footage of the first open source robot that does chores. It doesn't kill you or murder you. It just does chores. Which For is now. So cute. You got to see this video. Uh, maybe, Wendy, you can have a he little video cute. of it I, showing. I can see the little robot. Quite adorable. Yeah. Yep, yep. And this all started when Hugging Face hired an engineer, Remy Kadeen of Paris, France, stealing this talent directly from Tesla. So there you go. Mm-hmm. And the robot can move its full body, including its neck. And the video is able to take commands like putting a cup up, which my wife would love. Uh, if I actually did that, because, well, for me, it's the cans of soda that I open, pour into my Stanley and then leave the can on the counter and the trash can's like three feet away. 
Um, so if I had this robot, it would be solved because See, the robot that's what I it. thought. If we talk to Ryan's wife, he's not perfect. Yeah, yeah there's, <laughs> <laughs> darn right about that. And then there's another person asking for an apple, and the uh, robot goes and hands him the apple. And so I think it's really cool to see robotics and AI here, open source, all working together, and to do something positive. Not hallucinating, just doing some chores around the house. And this, I can get behind. I mean, if you, if your chores require your robot to stand in the exact same spot the entire time and just move its arms and stuff then your chores would be really easy to be fixed with this thing. Uh, I don't know. But you ever folded laundry? You sit there at the exact same spot folding laundry, and it's the worst thing ever. Folding laundry is the worst chore on the planet. Am I right? Disagreed. No, cleaning the bathroom is the worst chore ever. <sighs> yeah. I could get over cleaning yes. the bathroom. I don't want to fold laundry. <laughs> My arms get tired, you know? <laughs> with, with those well, baby arms, huh? Yeah. <laughs> baby arms get tired, man. <laughs> you and your noodle arms, yeah. Yeah. Like a lot to sit there and just keep doing over. And there's so much clothing. I don't know how my family goes through so much clothing. Half of it's mine, but still. I'm blaming them. And usually gym, gym shirts. And I generally don't mm-hmm. fold it when yeah. my wife does. But the point is that the times I've helped, it's helped fold it. It's really strenuous and I feel bad. Okay, good to know. So uh, anyway, back to the topic. The, uh, the point about it is that it might seem like this is like a basic aspect of this robot, but what's cool is is that they showed on Twitter that or X whatever that it um, is actually improved and uh, on a very quick basis, and they didn't do a lot of time to train it to do these certain things. So they said twenty thousand uh, lines of training. I don't know what the, I forgot the term they actually describe it as, but the the way they did it is like twenty thousand was able to do one thing, and then it added forty thousand was able to do another thing, and they were able to do it with it without having to put in like tons and tons of training. And that in itself is impressive because it was able to do those things with the a minimal amount of time that you would expect, you know, some kind of yeah. robotic a, a project to have. Yeah. Yeah. They must be using the camera sensors in some way that it can sense the object and the shape in order to build up that training and make it faster and more efficient. I know for my kids, the FLL teams, their robot is 100% autonomous. Yes, it can come back home, they can pick it up, and they can start another program. But when it's on the field, it has to do everything 100% itself. And it's amazing as you start to think of all the little teeny tiny steps involved in and what we typically have the kids do the first time as we're teaching code is tell us how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, they're like, get out the peanut butter, get out the jelly and the bread. Then you just literally have that, you know, sitting there in front of you. So all of those steps, like if you're detail oriented, telling how to make one from start to finish, that's a lot of little steps. And so in coding something, them just coding their robot to do tasks on the the field can or definitely it adds up between the functions that they're using and the actual lines of code to do that, that adds up really, really quickly. So to not only have a robot that is doing that autonomously, plus being able to understand, hey, that's the apple that I need to pick up and hand to this person that I'm physically seeing and putting it in their hand are major steps. Yeah. Yeah. It's also uh, very important that this robot is uh, doing a lot of reaching for things named Ricci. Is it named Ricci? It is named Ricci. Oh, that's cute. I didn't see the name of the robot in there. But, you know, I was thinking that I've seen some training models now where they're utilizing AI for the robots. But what they're doing is they have a human video record the human doing something like washing dishes and then putting Mm -hmm. them up. And then they feed that to the AI, which then creates the instruction set for the robot that can then repeat that task, which is fascinating, right? Some of the use cases for AI in there. Well, we also got a note from Jill and I think she wasn't able to make it to the show, but she was able to make content into the show. And that is in one of the videos, it shows Ricci folding a shirt. (gasps) I love Ricci. Oh, I love you, (laughs) Ricci. Oh man! So that, Ryan will be getting a robot in order I'm to getting the laundry. His wife is going to be ecstatic. His wife. <laughs> I know when she listens to this episode, she's gonna be like, "You help with laundry when? <laughs> Listen, my arms hurt, <laughs> so I don't do it often. They hurt. It's you should just tell her to skip this episode. And she, yeah, she yeah. won't be suspicious at all. We'll skip this right, one yeah. for sure. We'll just skip it. 
No, I think this is kind of the the play though, is that we're going to have a future. We have the Roombas already, right? And they're kind of right. funny. Uh, they, they help some, but then, you know, if the dog makes a mess on the floor, it'll spread that mess all over the place too. Like there's a lot of issues with the technology, but it's gotten better. And then now we have the situation where you have robots who are going to be able to potentially, to Michael's point, stand there and do some of these tasks that we won't want to do. But it's not very hard to put tracks on a robot or wheels or something else. Yes, to make it walk like a human, very, very sophisticated. I was just making a joke that if you see this yeah. video, it doesn't seem like it's much. But also the way they described it, it didn't require that much to train it. Obviously, it, it took a lot of effort to build the thing, of course. Right. But in terms of training it to using AI to, to teach it what it needed to do, it didn't seem to take that much, which is awesome. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to say. Like, yeah, it might look a little janky in the video, but at the same time, it's also very impressive where they were first what they were able to build to function and then also to teach it what to do very quickly. Mm -hmm. And the potential there is uh, one, fantastic, especially the laundry thing, and also terrifying because what if it's the first Terminator, Ryan? Ooh, good point. Like it's just pretending to do nice things. Exactly. You, you exactly. know, it's a good point because these robots are going to be extraordinarily strong when we put them in our homes. And if they malfunction or hallucinate and just start whacking away with their arm in the air and you happen to be near, like there's some problems here. So, yeah. you uh -huh. know, I'm just going to have to be fully it, armed it, while my robot's around so I can take them out. <laughs> That'd you know? be a little bit excessive probably. But it does remind Unless me of... liquid metal. Then <laughs> well, then it's probably not a robot anymore. Then it's whatever that is. So, um, <laughs> so... This it's also interesting because it reminds me of the uh, the booth we went to at Red Hat Summit where we talked to Intel and they had this robot that was able to detect a human and when it does it would slow itself down or completely stop and not go towards the thing it was supposed to do. So this kind of thing uh, and also Intel is really good about open sourcing stuff. So if this kind of stuff was all connected, we could maybe have a you know a um, robot made. This well, okay. One thing where a, a robot mate nice that doesn't try to kill us. <laughs> Magneto, step in. Magneto, as anybody who doesn't listen to LOL, is actually my husband. That's the nickname he's been given is Magneto. And he works on for By Ryan, I think, so right? he's, <laughs> I think so. I think Ryan is actually the one who gave him well, that nickname. Yeah. Um, but he, he works on forklifts and in places where they are using sensors in order to not run into people and not run into objects. And time and time again, in actual application, he's seeing forklifts that are running way too slow because they think something is constantly in front of them or mm -hmm. other issues that he's dealing with. So while these sound great in practice and usually the prototypes that they have at the booth run amazingly, what some of these people who work on these things once they're in the field are seeing is they don't work as good as you think they do. Yeah. It makes sense, yeah. But it's also no, when better you look to be at Tesla more, and it's autonomous, autonomous driving, it's the same mm -hmm. thing, right? Like most of right. the time when it's a regular road and you're going down that road and there's a stoplight and it's very predictable, it seems to work really well. Mm -hmm. The moment you put a construction cone out there, it freaks out. And in one video I saw like it was driving down the road and then there was a construction barrel and it just turned towards the construction barrel to run into it. Like it just, those things, those oddities is where, you know, it kind of, these things kind of lose their capability today, but obviously right. it's going to get better. And when Facebook goes fully open source and uh, makes the, it, anyways. Which is it. totally happening, obviously. You well, heard it here yeah, first. Ryan said it, if it so does, it's happening. Yeah. Uh -huh. if, you, if, we, you, if it happens, we predicted it. So yeah. you heard it here first. I can't <laughs> wait to smoke million dollar bills with Mark Zuckerberg. Just like light them up. I don't like, think hey, open sourcing. <laughs> I don't think open sourcing would would make him give you money. Yeah, I don't think so. Why not? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. That's the spirit. <laughs> Maybe I'm hallucinating. <laughs> well, speaking of villains and superheroes, your husband, Magneto, we've got a game that uh, he may want to play <laughs> called Capes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Jill left a note here and said, Michael and Ryan are my superhero hosts here at Destination Linux. See, that's so sweet. Wendy, you don't leave sweet notes like that. When you're editing our show or anything. No, you just, no, I usually don't know. Huh. You should be more like Jill. You should try really to be more like Jill. Okay, we should all be more so, like Jill, really. Yes. I am. Everybody should be more like Jill. And I don't think that is something why I may aspire 
to be more like Jill <laughs> is ever going to happen. I'm just being really, honest, right? Like, you really aspire even? I don't think there's any aspiration even. <laughs> I think you like being evil. Sinister, I mean. Sinister, I'm, not, I'm evil. not evil or sinister. You are also the one who gave me that nickname. I, I get and, a lot of people um, nicknames with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only fire back, right? Like, yes, yes, The reason you do. why you ended up looking like a d- because, well, you were acting like one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get back to the game. I told you all she's sinister. Get your Sinister <laughs> Wendy t-shirt at our store. It's still there. It's one of the best shirts out there. It's very fitting. So 20 years ago, the supervillains, Wendy and her husband, won. <laughs> Since then, they've created a dystopian city where developing superpowers is a crime. Nobody has managed to slow them down until now. Capes is a turn-based superhero strategy game where you build a team of heroes and fight Wendy and Magneto to take the city back. I added that part. I mean, that's how I'll be playing it in my head. Is right, and also, yeah. they would not say that because then they get sued by Marvel to call it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, yes, exactly. This game looks really cool. I love the whole superhero concept. Uh, I love playing games based on this. And oh, yeah. the fact that you can recruit new heroes, team up, Four heroes with unique superpowers that can work together in a very turn-based game. I love turn-based games. Fallout being one of my favorite out there. kind of gives you some time to think and prepare. You know, if you've got a bunch of different superpowers and things, you got different villains, you got a couple seconds to figure out what you want to do. And I like that, like a chess battle. I've never played Fallout, but um, the the (laughs) turn-based thing... Pathetic. (laughs) I don't have time for all my Rocket League. The... uh, so I, I I'm not really into the the turn based. The last time I played turn based games or RPGs specifically is uh, Final Fantasy VII, which was mm. good, but obviously that was a long time ago. And it's just like for me, it takes too long. Like I I'm just not patient enough. I guess you need uh, but, rockets and soccer balls bouncing right. everywhere. To- yeah, it's it, not like fast paced games. But we need to time yeah. out for just a second because while Wendy does play some games, yes, I just did refer to myself in third person. Sinister <laughs> Wendy, you, you weren't accurate about your name, though. I have no idea what a turn-based game is. So do you want to give me a quick definition of what that Yeah, is? so turn-based is kind of, let's say you're um, like in a Fallout scenario. You're going through a city and then a big monster appears in the distance. It will pause the game for a second right there and allow you to kind of prepare Okay. to do a certain amount of steps. And then once you're done with those steps and you do your attack or you equip some stuff or do a potion to heal, then it flips over to the villain and it's their turn. So think of it like a chess battle where you go back and forth. Each back person forth gets a turn to deploy their strategy. And it just okay. gives you more time. Like in a, in a regular like fighting game, you know, you're just button mashing or you've got certain combos and things that you're hitting, but there's not a lot of time to really think out the battle. Whereas... In these turn-based strategy games, you get a little more time to really kind of so play. So my and kids utilize. play Prodigy. I don't know if your kids do. So it's a, a math game. Is that one, would that one be considered a turn-based I don't know game? Because you have time. So you have to solve time. the math problem. And then you get to fire off whatever magic or thing at the other player. And then they can fire yeah, back at so you. So that's You're definitely like, turn-based. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Everybody's my kids like turn- it. There you go. <laughs> so I love this idea in a superhero world because it means it probably could have more sophisticated powers and strategies to use against certain villains. Maybe certain um, things wouldn't work against certain villains, so you could try different stuff out in your turn base. It's very cool. And Jill left a note that a lot of people are commenting it works really well on the Steam Deck. So the game's capes is $39.99 on Steam and is published by one of Jill's favorite game houses, Daedalic Entertainment. Daedalic. Daedalic. D a e d a l i c Entertainment. Sports links. Penguins out of the box. So go check it out. So we've talked about AI in this episode. Oh, a, a little, like just a occasionally, just to dabble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so why not talk about more? Except in this case. This is a local-based thing, and that is our software spotlight with GPT-4 all, the number four. All one. We'll we'll link in the show notes. So we have things like, you know, Siri. Garbage. uh, Google Assistant. Garbage. Alexa. Garbage. Whatever. Cortana, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, whatever. No one even cares about yours as Microsoft. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, now it's just Chat GPT, so it's actually oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, is it though? Is it really? <laughs> it also hallucinates quite a bit. But anyway, the problem here is that these are not open source. And the software spotlight this week, like I said, is an open source assistant that is free to use and the kicker locally running on your system. And it doesn't seem to require tons and tons and tons and tons of setup, which is, I think is great because they have a flat pack. Thank you. Wow. It's It's really good, Michael. Like this software spotlight, this thing is really well done. First of all, you get this really nice GUI when you install the flat pack. And the first thing it asks you is to choose a model. And guess what's there? Facebook's Llama. So this is all running locally again. Now, they do have an option to connect through API keys. So if you wanted to connect it to chat GPT or something like that, you can. But otherwise, the models are local. And so you have Mistral, Falcon, Llama, Llama 2, MPT, Replit, Starcoder, all of these options. In there. Wow. So I was playing with Llama. And its replies are really good. When we were in the WhatsApp discussion, I asked it, is WhatsApp truly end-to-end encrypted and private, for instance? And it is what spit back to tell me that, you know, it is end-to-end, but there's issues with the fact of the data that it is collecting, um, specifically, you know, the person you're talking to and that type of stuff. And also goes and talks about all the potential um intercepts and and the fact that we don't know what happened on the server it goes through all of these details and it mentioned that it uses signals protocol an edited version of that so really good response right from a from a pretty interesting question there and right all run locally here so i don't have to give all of my data and information out to somebody else Um, i also asked it if meta should go fully open source and it said 100 (laughs) percent yeah it didn't say that but i just want to of course. And it did. Yeah. But also, so it has a lot of cool features. And like you mentioned, like it, it looks very nice. It actually feels like a basic chat uh, bot system. I didn't want to call it chat GPT because it's not. I mean, I guess you could technically. But uh, the fact that it has all these different models is really cool because I was only thinking of Llama and Mixtral and you started naming off the other ones and I didn't, haven't even heard of some of those. So I'm very excited to try these out. And I think it's very cool. If I had the ability to. Uh, switch between them. Like I send a message and say, here, I want this. And, you know, here's the, here's the prompt and it outputs something from Llama. It'd be really cool if I could switch it and say, okay, now I want it from Mixtral just to compare, you know, you can switch cool. models in your chat. So every time you click new chat, you can switch and choose a different model, which is really cool. That is and awesome. I told it to write me a Python program that told dad jokes and it actually wrote some really nice Python here and spit out the entire program. So this is not a like a toy. Okay, thing. hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> what is one of the dad jokes? Uh, why did the Uh-oh. scarecrow win an award? Because he was outstanding, outstanding in, his field. in his field. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it's what do you be call unique, a fake right? noodle? A fake oh, noodle? A fake, yeah. I don't. I don't know this one. An imposta. I did know this one. Dang it! I forgot. Ah, so good. So this is something I'm definitely going to have to download and install. I have used something like this in the past, not not necessarily this one, but to help me write letters. And so I wrote the letter that I wanted and I have to be honest, it wasn't a very nice letter. And then I said, hey, take this letter and make it nice. (laughs) That explains so much about that thing she sent us. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That letter was so nice, Wendy, by the time it got to us. We didn't know that chat GPT (laughs) was what edited it. Okay, okay. Uh, Not the one where I was sending you feedback about robotics. No, not that one. I did uh, write that one myself. uh, But uh, I have, in the past, wrote the letter I wanted and then let AI make it nice for me. It's it's probably a really good use for that. (laughs) (laughs) But I also want to say that it's this is a really cool uh, idea and a really cool application. And I think that if you are interested in any kind of AI stuff, first of all, one, you should be because it's going to be changing a lot of stuff. I mean, AI is super annoying. And the fact that so many things are building in AI for the most ridiculous reasons and our operating systems are now getting AI that are just completely intrusive, a.k.a. Windows and apparently iPhone. Who knows what they're going to do with this? But the, and to be real quick, real quick, there are people who are coming from like these other operating systems to Linux because of this ridiculous stuff like Windows Recall and all that. Uh And I just want to say that 
the AI is going to be inter- integrated into Linux in some way or another. It's already been worked on and that sort of thing. But the thing, the difference is, is that you have the control over it rather mm-hmm. than having control over you. So it's okay in that sense. But I do kind of wonder, like, how far do we take this? You know, there's like the, um, there's, I can't remember the, the name of the movie, but there was this one movie where this, uh, this phrase, the comp, this, uh, this guy referenced this as saying, hey, how far are we going to go with this? And it says, well, actually, the question is, what level constitution do you have to go as far as needed? Mm. And I wonder, is that is that the philosophy we are taking with AI? Because it seems like it. We're not going to stop. And, and honestly, you can't put this back in the box. This is the problem, is because of the world we live in, where every country is constantly wanting to, it seems like, go to war with the other country, or at least dislike mm-hmm. each other. Uh, if the United States put laws in place to say, we're going to restrict some of this, well, that gives another country right, a head start because they're not going to restrict it and they're going to get right. further ahead. So we know no matter what, the government's not going to put any guardrails on any of this stuff. They're going to go for it. Is it like what we mutual citizens- destruction for technology? Or- yeah. yeah. It's just going to keep going and going and going and there's no stop to it. Yeah. So if some people say, you know, if, you're, if we're going to take a vote, some people are going to say nay. And others are going to say AI. Gosh, I don't even want. So let me tell you, though, <laughs> real quick, before we move on, how good Llama 3 is. Like, I'm genuinely, genuinely mm. impressed with this tool. Like, I, I'm probably going to utilize this more than any of the other ones out there. Let me give you an example. I gave it a prompt. We have a host that, particu- that is particularly sinister. Help her write a nice letter to two of her hosts Michael and Ryan, and keep it just two sentences. So here's the draft it wrote. Dear Michael and Ryan, I hope this letter finds you both well rested after the last show, because I'm about to unleash my wrath upon your unsuspecting ears with with another another episode. Does it actually? Sort of, but seriously, thanks for being amazing hosts with you two, or our show would be as dull as a lecture on crop rotation. Sinisterly yours, Wendy. Okay, if that's actually what it's swear, I will take a screenshot. Yeah, I'd actually yeah. write that letter. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's very good. It's really good. Like you guys got to check this thing out. This is this yeah, is definitely absolutely. an app to install. Real quick, I just want to point out it, it does say it's unverified, and that just means that it's not being maintained by the official project that is working on it. So uh, just just want to make that in, in case you care that you know just. If you, you know. want an official package, you have to be on Ubuntu, Apple, or Windows. Ah, uh, that's a bummer. But at least there's a flat pack you can install if you want. Right, you can install it. Speaking of installing things, uh, you can't do that if it's Adobe-based. And uh, But we do have some news related to Adobe that's really interesting. And it's kind of like the tip of the week, which is a basically... business? Thank God. Uh, that's, I mean, no matter what they do, they don't, they don't seem to be able to do that. But um, so... It's interesting because Adobe has been in the news recently and they've been under fire for the past few weeks because they changed something with their uh, terms of service and their new policies. And what's funny to me is that a lot of people are freaking out over this, but the only thing that they actually changed is they changed their terms of service related to machine learning and what they're allowed to use your content for, as in it's a non-exclusive completely like global licensing to be able to do effectively whatever they want with it. So it doesn't, you know, you have no control over what they do with it. So they could use it to do machine learning and that sort of stuff. And people were freaking out about it because it's like, Oh my God, how, how are you changing this? Like, how, wh- what do you, how, how could they do this? It's funny because it has been saying the exact same thing for f- four years. The only thing they changed was they added an example to that part of the terms of service of what they were referring to. And people then, and they and they notified people. So the, really, the only thing they did was notify people that they had this in there. And first of all, Adobe's you know notoriously been a, an annoying company for many many years. So that's many not years. surprising that they would do it. But the yeah. biggest issue here is that they had this thing where the cloud users, which if you're using Adobe these days, you're using Creative Cloud, and you have no choice. They're having their files in this in the cloud system with the uh, when they upload it and they're working on it and they had a button that says, if you don't agree, you have to stop using it. 
So you have to agree in order to get your files back. So if you were working on something and then all of a sudden this happened, you'd be locked away from your stuff. Apparently all this was to train AI, people were saying. Like they were trying yeah. to use everyone's artwork to train their AI. I mean, so probably, that, uh, you know. Well, I'd not, already heard some hubbub about that before of like artists saying, you know, why are you trying to put us out of business? If you can take all of the work that we've done, use it to train your AI, then what will they need us for, right? Because yeah, they'll yeah. get that style or whatever through There's it. already people talking about this. There's actually someone yeah. who posted a, a video on YouTube talking about how they were replaced. Uh, they were a designer who was replaced by AI and what they were, they were, they were being paid a lot of money not knowing that their stuff was being put into a mm -hmm. machine learning. And then they took all their templates and then they built the thing to basically take this guy's style and create a thing without him. And this is like crazy because of the fact that like that Adobe is not, is gonna, they're going to get away with it to a degree, but they're also going to make people very nervous and leave, which is great because there are some great alternatives. Some of them work on Linux and some of them don't. So first of all, let's talk about the one that doesn't work on Linux. And that is infinity, affinity, uh, infinity photo. And uh, it's it's a really good application, but sadly, it doesn't work on Linux. But there are other ones, too. Apparently, and you can get it to work in Linux if you utilize, like, uh, some of the Wine applications and things to a degree. It's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, I would wonder be worth if bottles. I wonder if it would run in bottles. I am That's now what very it was. It, it was yeah. bottles, I think somebody mentioned. Because I looked it up, Michael, because I didn't. I wasn't aware of Affinity. And you mentioned it in a prior episode or one before that. And I oh, looked yeah. it up to see if it ran in Linux. And a lot of people were talking about the problem. They wish it did run in Linux. But a lot of people were also saying there's workarounds to use it mm. in a wine mm. variation. So uh, I don't know how successful it is because I haven't tried it myself. But it doesn't run natively, to your point. But it is right. maybe something people can get to run. If you could do it in bottles, that would be close enough to me to test it out and that sort of thing because I have used it before and it is pretty good because I heard about it and then I just wanted to test it because um, it's very reasonably priced. So you basically get, I think it's like 50 bucks or something or maybe it's like 100, I'm not sure. But then you can also get lifetime license and stuff. Yeah. And that, that, that is nice. crazy. So yes. if this was, if this was available, that'd be fantastic. But there are other options. Now, the other two options are web-based which means they're not necessarily native, but it does mean you can use them on Linux. And one of them is for people who can who are not professionals, but be able to do professional-like things, such as uh, creating a, a template and just modifying stuff. So that is called Canva. So it's really good for people who are like Ryan, who can't do art that well, and mm. uh, be able I'm to output up. stuff that is you know relatively passable. Already signed up. And then, yeah, yeah he, he already has an account for sure. <laughs> as soon as I found Canva, I was like, Ryan, you have to use this. <laughs> Please, <laughs> yeah. stop, stop begging me for artwork. Just use this. <laughs> the then. other advantage of Canva is you can actually share it between different people. So that is actually how our um, rookie FTC team put together their engineering portfolio. They all wrote their separate pieces inside of a different document. And then they mm -hmm. were able to come together in Canva and finish laying out stuff for their engineering portfolio. Really nice Thanks. for that kind of thing too. Yeah. yeah. And also one of the things that I've recently found that is uh, very interesting to me, and hopefully it means a more positive movement towards the Linux support, even though they technically don't make for Linux, but they have it, right. you know, Canva recently purchased Affinity Photo and Ooh. basically all the Affinity stuff. So it's possible that we would get, you know, you know, mm. fingers crossed, maybe. But in the meantime, we do have something that is called Photo P, which I use every day. Mm -hmm. Photo P is fantastic. This is for this is actually a professional level tool that you can use, unlike Canva that gives you like professional output for people who are not professionals. Photo P gives you all the tools that you need for professional. You get uh, adjustment layers, filters, smart objects, warping, uh, puppet warping, uh, ba basically anything you can think of, even AI generative stuff. Everything GIMP doesn't have. Uh, that's true, yes. Yeah. Uh, so Ooh, for, I'm going to okay. get some nice hate e emails on those. And also the best part is that I didn't say it this time. I'm baiting y'all. So, so for real quick though, just to kind of you know calm the waters a bit, 
GIMP is perfectly suitable for, for me, a large... Pr- but nobody with talent above mine in art. That's basically it. For the average person who wants to do something occasionally or very rarely, then GIMP can solve that problem. If you are someone who works in it all the time and needs these specific features like smart objects and layer styles and all these sorts Look, of I'm things. I'm just going to say it. GIMP is the Microsoft paint of Linux. Like, it's not good anymore. It's really not. Like, it's great that we have something, and that's all we can say. We have something. But it is not at any caliber close to a artistic program anymore. It's gone so far behind. The releases are so slow. And maybe they don't have funding and all this stuff, which they could fix, but they won't. And uh, so GIMP is what it is. So I'm going to be the one on the show that's not going to whisper sweet nothings in all your ears and just tell you, like, GIMP is basically what Microsoft Paint was to Microsoft. And by the way, Microsoft Paint's gotten a lot better recently, uh, unlike GIMP. So uh, Photo P would be your option there. Okay, so first of all. Hey, Ryan, so what were you creating in uh, Microsoft Paint recently? Oh, uh, stick figures. Mm, okay. <laughs> really that's all he ones. does ever anywhere. <laughs> if you have a piece of paper, that's all he's going to do is stick figures. <laughs> stick figure. Yeah. Insert but, a picture of Ryan's art here. I'm not I'm not an <laughs> artist, but the the reason why I mention this is because I constantly see it on Reddit of people suggesting GIMP and then yeah. the actual artists go yeah. there and go, "What are you guys this doesn't work. This okay. Okay, so this first is of all, not replacement for any professional art software at all. So there are people who swear by GIMP that you can use it professionally, and that's fine. It's If if you want to put yourself through that process, you are more than welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if someone is saying, I want to get away from Photoshop, what are my options? That means more than likely, if they are professional, this application that you're suggesting is not good enough. Like, it's just not. Because... Here's the thing that a lot of people don't know. People think like, well, well, GIMP has been around for so long, it should have a lot of features. It doesn't have something called adjustment layers, which is basically the concept of having a layer on top of another layer and then making tweaks to the top layer to automatically affect the bottom layer without actually changing the bottom layer. This is a very powerful thing because it means you can add tweaks at any time without affecting, like you don't have to worry about undo. You can always go back and change it. This was in, put into Photoshop in 1996, the same year GIMP was started. So the difference is very big. So right. it's, it's one thing to say that you can do certain things and GIMP is okay, good enough. But it, it is also, it's also very, very far. For, I would not consider a both tool. Canva and Photop more on your graphic design spectrum, where if you're actually looking for art, then Krita would be the place yes. to go. Krita is a instead fantastic of program. Yes. 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 yes, I would absolutely agree. Krita is fantastic. Um, Photop is a great solution for people who want to have all the different uh, features that they are used to because Photop is a web app. And it is like 80, 85% as good as Photoshop. This it blew me awesome. away. Like, yeah, when I found Photop, so, I, I was blown away because I spent- Photop's amazing. I spent easily 20 years in Photoshop. And when right. I saw Photop, like, wow. Not because the UI is the same or whatever that some people will say like, oh, GIMP's UI is different. That's the problem. It's not that. It's all the features that do exist in Photo P. Yeah. So good. Well, team shirts were actually laid out this year inside of Photo P. So the Building Beast team shirts, and I'm going to have to throw a picture in here, but they have like paint splatters all over the back, that kind of thing that was designed in there. And then I printed it using my sublimation printer and made the shirts for the kids. That's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Also, I, I think it. it's funny but that, you know, Wendy is the editor of the show for those who don't know. And the amount of things that she has given herself to put up on screen in this episode, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. I, I, like I was going to do it anyway. I'm just, you know, voicing the fact that, hey, I'll throw She it puts up. more work on herself when she's doing the show <laughs> than even after. No, I don't know about that. Sometimes you yeah. guys give me plenty of work. Don't, don't <laughs> pat yourself on the back there. Yeah, that drill meter was probably a bit. Oh, the drill meter was great. But she she definitely paid me back for giving her that work. There's no doubt in that episode. <laughs> in there. So like, um, yeah, these are some really good alternatives. Photo P as a, um, I don't know what you want to call me, terrible artist that sometimes has to play with these art programs is my favorite 
uh, to utilize along with Krita. Like I give my kids Krita. Krita is so much fun to play with. The interface is fantastic. It's well laid out. It's well designed. Uh, I do not recommend suggesting GIMP to anybody unless you're like, what's a good alternative to the original Microsoft Paint? All right, so a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. You can come join us on Discord at tuxdigital.com slash Discord. You can tell me how wrong I am because there's extensions in GIP that make it really cool if you just search for a thousand years. If you want to do that, you can put that in the Discord and we can talk about it. And if you want to watch the show live, you can become a patron of the show, Destination Linux. And you can yell at Ryan directly at right after directly. the show. <laughs> right in my face. Exactly. You can become a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership. And like we said, there you can watch us live, but you can also join us in the patron-only post show that happens every week after the show and tell Ryan why he's so wrong about GIMP if you want to. You know, there's it's, that's an option. Tuxdigital.com slash membership to do that. And we also have other ways you can support the show and the channel, like the Tux Digital Store. So go to tuxdigital.com slash store, where we have t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, hats, and so much more, tuxdigital.com slash store. Make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on Tux Digital. That's right. We have an entire network full of geeky goodness. I've heard it a million times, but I can't say it. That's okay. Check out This Week in Linux for your source of Linux GNUs, which is a weekly video podcast with Michael as your host, who walks you through the happenings of Linux and open Wonderful. source every week, unless you're editing it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's not wonderful. <laughs> not wonderful? <laughs> Good one, Wendy. Good one. No, it's a fantastic show. There's just, you know, layers upon Love layers. It. Just it's a lot of editing. Way he if, does if art. There's layers upon layers. <laughs> Dang, what a callback. Okay. Wow. That was fantastic. And I, yes. I did, I, we, you can actually use adjustment layers in Resolve, which is fantastic. Yes, you too. can. Yeah, so, but anyway, I have simplified the process of Twill's editing. It is still a monster. <laughs> yeah. Well, we appreciate the okay show yeah. you do. Uh, everyone head to tuxdigital.com and to subscribe to all of our shows. We have a lot of them. And we have even some coming back. We like Pseudo Show is back. Mm -hmm. There's tons of other stuff yeah. coming. And uh, be sure to go, go there and get your full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. By the way, Wendy, we've enjoyed having you on the show. And people who don't know, check out Linux Out Loud, which Wendy is on that podcast, which is video now as well. Yes, it's video. That's right. Now. Go check out Linux Out Loud. Everybody we actually, have a great week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Also, by the way, we were going to have Wendy uh, send us something there, about the... the <laughs> Good job, <Wendy. laughs> Nice. The, the Lego thing we talked about previously, she uh -huh. sent in a feedback, and then we're like, well, we just have Wendy on now instead. We'll just, you know, talk yeah, about robotics that way. <laughs> Remember, I didn't really talk about anything that I talked about in the clip, but... I mean... Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we did it. We had, we, had to, us. we had to stop for time. We tried. We That's what matters. Yeah. <laughs> hey, tried, Michael, Wendy. on a yes. scale from one to 10, the hate I'll get for the GIMP comment, uh, 10 being the worst, they hope I die. One being like, eh, they'll forget about it. Eight and 15. a half, probably. Eight and 15. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it. <clears throat>